Well, hi, everybody. Al Bernstein here with another one of our boxing hangouts um, here in Washington, D.C., where tomorrow night uh, we'll be bringing you on Showtime uh, the fight between Lamont Peterson and Derry Jean and also uh, Gabe Rosado and uh, Jermel Charlo, and which should be a really good double header. In a moment, we're going to have a very special guest, um, but I want to, of course, introduce Stan Parks, who produces the Hangouts, as you know, and uh, is a man that uh, keeps everything, the trains running on time, and uh, <laughs> makes sure that we, can, that we can reach you, and um, Dan, this should be fun tonight. I'm excited. These are a couple of uh, great matchups, and uh, I'm really excited to uh, have our special guest here tonight. Yes, it would be very good. And in fact, um, uh, first I want to tell you, uh, by the way, that um, uh, tomorrow night's fights, of course, seen on Showtime uh, in the United States starting at 9 p.m. Uh, uh, Eastern Standard Time and Western Stand and uh, Pacific Time as well. Um, and of course, working with me on the broadcast, and I'm going to bring him in here right now, Gentleman who you all know, Paulie Malinaji, um, world champion uh, and great broadcaster who's doing a terrific job. Yep. And uh, Paulie, tomorrow, you know, we had a chance to sit down and talk with the fighters um, and, uh, and, and, and ask them a little bit about, uh, you know, what was going to take place on Saturday or what they thought. And let's talk first about uh, Gabe Rosado and Jermel Charlo, which is. Um, an intriguing matchup. A couple of 154 pounders in different places in their careers. Yeah, you know, you have Rosado, who's a guy that has been in a lot of the best fighters, uh, especially in the past year or so. You know, hasn't always come up on the on the good end of the stick, so to speak. Yeah. But he's uh he's always a tough customer. He's won some important fights. He's lost some important fights. He's definitely a guy that can be a measuring stick to see if Charlo belongs on this high level. Um, obviously, Rosado will tell you he's not a measuring stick. He's the guy yeah. that belongs here. Yeah. He's the guy you should be looking at. But Jamel Charlo is the guy with the undefeated record. He's the guy that he's the <clears throat> quote unquote prospect contender to watch. You know, so so uh, Rosado has been in this position before. Uh, we saw it last year with uh, yeah. with uh, Jaleon Love yep. actually with a guy who was trying to step up. Um, and Rosado uh, made Jaleon look not so great. You know, but uh, he kind of Rosado kind of proved himself as the guy that you. I guess the gatekeeper in a way, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, but he's shown himself to be a bit better than that. So we'll see how how much Charlo has. Let's talk about uh, Charlo for a second. Uh, who is a young man, a 23 year old, who is uh, 22 and 0. He has uh, uh, fair power, uh, 11 KOs in his 22 fights, uh, good boxing skills, and when you're going to take your first step uh, in a, this is really his, his his biggest match to date, and probably certainly the best fighter he's ever fought. What's the mindset going in when you know you're in your first big match, and especially your first title match? Well, I think I think he's uh, you know mentally focusing on the game plan. He's excited because mm -hmm. you, you the excitement comes from knowing that if you beat somebody like this, you are now in the conversation yeah. of all the big fights. Mm -hmm. Charlo has always been a guy to look out for at, in the junior middleweight division. Him and yeah. his, he and his brother are, have been prospects to, to watch. So yeah, well, you know what I should say. I said title match. I meant going into his first title match. So. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he, and, uh, he and his brother have been uh, prospects to watch, so to speak. And mm -hmm. now... You know, so they've kind of never been in the conversation for the main fights. They've yes, always been guys right. who will, were looked at as guys who will eventually be there. So a win over a guy like Rosado, who was kind of in the mix himself, mm -hmm. now proves that Charlo deserves to be in the conversation yeah. when you mention big fights in the 154-pound division. So it's it, there's a lot at stake, but for a young fighter who's always felt he belongs there and he, mm -hmm. the goal has been to be there and has always been looked at as a guy who will eventually right. be there, it's also an exciting time. Yeah, Charlo. Of course, this fight is an eliminator to fight for one of the 154 pound titles. Now, when we visited with Charlo at the um, fighter meetings, he seemed really confident um, and not filled with bravado, but it really seemed like he was very relaxed and very confident. Is there any chance you think he's underestimating Gabe Rosado? Um, I don't think. I don't take it as he's trying to underestimate him. I, I take it as people are probably looking at him to. And wondering, oh, how's he reacting mm, in his first big right, fight? So right. he's probably trying to make it seem, oh, this point. is just any other fight for yeah, me. You know, yeah. it's kind of a, a young man who's coming into his own, mm -hmm. but he doesn't want to show people that he understands right. this is too big of a moment for him. Right. Know? And not that it is, it probably won't yeah. be. He's a good fighter. He's just he'll, conscious he'll, he'll of it. Yeah, yeah, he's conscious of it, but he doesn't want to have people overthinking it. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to make it like it's it's just any fight. But I think uh, I think Jamel Charlo understands what's on the line here. 
Yeah. Now, Gabe Rosado, <clears throat> who is an interesting guy, both, by the way, all, all the four of the fighters we, we, we visited today, just, uh, I'm reminded, and I'm constantly reminded, and I'm sitting here with a, you know, former world champion and a great fighter, I'm reminded how often I feel like I'm at fighter meetings, and I don't want anyone to lose. You know, I don't want any of these four fighters to lose because they're such great guys. Gabe Rosado is a perfect example of that, you know. You see the 21-7 and seven record. For, for those of you that, that may not be uh, remember his last year, he made a great statement to us. You know, he said, I didn't win a fight in 2013, but I won a lot of fans. And, and that's a fact. Of course, he lost to uh, Gennady Golovkin as he moved up from 154 to 160. He had, with Jay Leon Love, he, he arguably could have easily gotten that decision. It was called a decision for Love. Then Love tested positive for drugs, and it was a no decision. And then against Peter Quill in his last fight, it was a dead-even fight probably, but he had all the momentum in the fight at that point, and, and it, was, it was stopped because of a bad cut. So here's a guy who has won over the fans, but this fight, after those three fights in a row without a win, pretty darn important for him. Absolutely. And, you know, it can be argued that, hey, those fights were 160 pounds. Yeah. Now he's going back to 154 pounds where he's had the, the bigger part of his career at that weight, you know. Um, you can <clears> say <throat> that, I mean, people will say, you know, he might be draining himself. Yeah. He'll, he may tell you, hey, this is my more natural weight. This is where I'm, I'm, I'm a bigger, stronger guy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pros and cons here to be discussed for Rosado fighting at 154 pounds. I think the common denominator, though, is that he's shown himself to be an upper-level fighter regardless of him being a junior middleweight or the middleweight division. Yeah. Yeah, and he's aggressive, man. He he makes for fan friendly fights. He's from Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. What? Well, <laughs> say more. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to our main event um, and talk a little bit about. Uh, we'll start out with um, Lamont Peterson, uh, who still has his title because the last uh, non-title fight he fought was with Lucas Matisse, in which he uh, and you see the pictures of it. He, you know, he he was um, uh, knocked out by Matisse, stopped in the third round. And uh, that was a very difficult loss for him. Today when we would talk to him, obviously the most important thing for him was kind of convincing us and he, as he's been convincing the world and presumably convinced himself that there are no long-lasting effects from th that fight eight months ago. Yeah, and you know, mentally you always wonder how a fighter will come back mm -hmm. from a, a knockout loss or uh, a loss that devastating. Um, yeah, obviously, a fighter can react one of two ways. He can come back and let him spurn him and push him to a, a more positive direction, or he may be gun shy. And yeah. you know, as we saw with uh, Lucian Boutte against Jean Pascal, you start to wonder if he had had the Carl Froch effect. Yeah. On him, you know, so sometimes fighters can react in one way or another coming off of a loss like that. Uh, Peterson tried his best to assure us that he's not thinking about any, any of that mm -hmm. negativity. And a veteran like him, you would assume that he knows how to get past that, but. We'll only find out once he wins the belt rings. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, he and Barry Hunter, they talked about it. It was interesting. Barry Hunter was telling us he tried to give him some time off and, and did to get away from boxing, but Lamont was so anxious to get back into the fray, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Yeah, and, you know, this is a guy who has a lot of passion for boxing. It's not just a job, but it's something he loves to do. Mm -hmm. So guys like that, it's hard to keep him out of the gym. You've, you came back, you've come back in your career from, from losses. What process did you go through to kind of mentally say to yourself, okay, that's in the past, I'm going to move forward? I think my approach was people are all going to talk about how this affects me and, and you know, um, when the fight <clears throat> is done or he'll never be the same again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 my approach has always been, you know what, there's plenty of people talking about that already, so I'll mm -hmm. let them discuss it and yeah, I'll yeah, worry yeah. about getting becoming better from it. I'll yeah. worry about become, you taking the positive and, and making myself a better fighter and making sure I don't go through that again. So so I, I think the approach has to be for Lamont the same way. I mean, there's already enough people discussing, like us, discussing about yeah, whether we are, yes. back the same way or not. Yeah. I think, you know, the approach that I would have taken, I would take, was is, is um, he should take is probably something similar to the, what I used to do with that, was um, let everybody else discuss that. Uh, I know what I'll be, I'm working on, and I'm working on becoming a better fighter off that experience. So, and in a way, out. that was kind of, it, it expressed it in different words, that was kind of what he was suggesting. Exactly. In that, yeah. um, by the way, uh, we want your questions, and I know some of you, in a moment or two, we're going to answer some of those questions, um, but send in questions for me and for Polly, uh, and uh, uh, we'll be able to answer them in a few minutes. Now, let's now uh, conclude the discussion of these fights with, um, uh, for the moment at least, uh, we're talking about Thierry Jean, who a 31-year-old uh, from Quebec now, originally from Haiti, who was undefeated at 25-0, and 0, and who waited a while to get his first world title match, but 
uh, he's a very good fighter, and for a lot of people that may not have seen Gary Jean, uh, they shouldn't think that he's some guy that was elevated by an organization just to be a number one contender. He's a solid fighter. Oh, absolutely. You know, he's uh, earned his way here. Uh, in the elevator, he beat a, a guy named Cleo Spendarvis, mm -hmm. who's a pretty good fighter in his own right. Um, you know, he's been a guy who's had to wait a little longer than most to yeah. get this title shot, but he's undefeated. Um, he's got. He seems to have the right mental makeup, uh, the way he's talking, the way he's uh, <clears throat> discussing things. He doesn't feel like he's a guy who's just been brought here as an opponent. He's no. a guy, being that he's undefeated and being that he's... Uh, battle tested in his own way, even with uh, situations outside the ring yeah. that have tested him a little bit. Guys like that, they come here to a title fight with sort of a chip on their shoulder. Mm -hmm. the, the correct chip on their shoulder. Yeah, right. He's, a cha he's challenging right. for a world championship, so the chip on his shoulder is necessary. But I took his personality as something of, hey, you know what? I'm here, and I'm here to win my championship. I'm here to do what I was destined to be, so to speak. And, and so I, I, I think I like his attitude going into a championship mm -hmm. fight. It's interesting, and he, he says he's going to test Lamont Peterson early in this fight, which you would expect, given to find out if there are any residual effects from, from the last fight. But interesting conversation kind of juxtaposing between the two men. On the one hand, uh, Lamont Peterson doesn't see uh, Dierry Jean watching videos as a, a wildly aggressive attacker. He said, you know, he's concerned about being hit, and he doesn't attack recklessly, and so that tells me something that I can stop him by hitting him. Yeah, well, you know, uh, if if Lamont is right um, in his assessment of, of yeah. John's character, because that's not really a technical flaw, that's a character right. flaw yeah, yeah, that's that he's point. discussing. And um, if he's right in assessing his character, then even if he doesn't get John out of there, he can keep him busy keep by him, yeah. keeping that sharp offense going his way. But a lot of times, a fighter's mental makeup is a bit different coming into a world mm -hmm. championship fight. He's a it's bit more point. determined than he usually is. So you don't always want to bank on mental or character flaws because a lot of times for championship fights, mm -hmm. those get thrown out, especially yeah. a fighter's first championship fight. So, so I think that the technical aspect of the fight should be more uh, what Lamont is concerned about. Um, I think we, we, you know, we discussed that uh, it would be better for Jean to get off to a fast start, yes. but he himself is not always a, such, a, such a quick no. starter. So no. it will be interesting to see what gives here. Yeah, and from a from a technique standpoint and a strategy standpoint, I thought John said some things that were seem like he's on the right track. He wants to use his jab a lot to jab his way in to get inside to do the pressure, and then he feels that that guard of of uh, Lamont Peterson when he gets it high will allow him to work the body. And and uh, John is a good body puncher. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they both are body punchers. Yes, body punchers. So and both have good uppercuts. Mm, absolutely. So you know, this is one of those fights that you know. It's like the old saying, yeah, everybody has a game plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, well, true. you know, there, that remains the case here in this yeah, fight, just like yeah. it is in all fights. But good fighters get punched in the face <clears> and make adjustments. So they just alternate the game plan. The game plan remains. You just have to alter it a little bit once you start getting punched in the face because you don't want to keep doing that. So I think both have a solid game plan. Uh, once their game plans kind of start to materialize into the mm -hmm. fight, we'll see who has the advantage, and then we'll see if the other guy can adjust. Yeah, very interesting. All right, now I know, uh, Dan, we've got some questions that have come in, and uh, you can give us your questions. Any questions uh, relating to this fight or uh, these fighters? Well, we have a couple related to this fight. Um, uh, one of them, uh, which is kind of a, a combination of several questions all put together, is uh, do you think that uh, Peterson, if he gets knocked out early tonight, is that like the the death knoll for him uh, hmm. ultimately yeah well that's good you you made the uh, there's different ways to lose obviously if he was to get knocked out early again from a purely marketing standpoint it would make it very difficult for him wouldn't it Polly but but a loss doesn't necessarily end his career it doesn't necessarily end his career um, Lamont Peterson doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would just end his career off no. of loss off of that kind of loss but it would definitely be difficult to get yeah. back in the mix. Um, right. I think the only reason he's remained here in the little bit of the mix is because his loss to Matisse wasn't a world title fight. That right. was kind of a silver right. lining. So yeah. uh, in order for him, he has kept his title, and so if he can defend it, he'll have some, some hardware yeah. that you know some other 140-pound champions or fighters, top contenders, will want to go after, so it'll keep him in the mix. He needs to win. I think he needs yeah. to win. It's and very so important. Even a, so even a, a decision loss in an exciting fight to Derry John, does that keep him at, because Jerry Jean is a good fighter? Does that keep him at least in a 140 pound division that is a little thinner than it was before? Yeah, well, but you, you think know, a win is pretty darn important. For I him, think huh? a win is pretty darn important. Yeah. Um, but a competitive loss, hey, you know, maybe not. Maybe not 
the end of yeah. the be all end all, but it definitely eliminates him from the big TV. Yes, yeah. sets him sets him back for sure, and you may have to rebuild a little bit. Maybe that, uh, you know, uh, thing I know all about. <laughs> you did that. You went through that process, and you and you rebuilt yourself to the point where you know, you get back uh, to big fights. Yeah, where you got a matter back. of the, how mentally strong. And you were only a little younger than him. He's thirty, but you were you were a little bit younger when you had to do that. But yeah, that's a yeah. That's, I was twenty nine when I lost the combat. Yeah, so, so there you go. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions there, Dan? That we should deal with. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, assuming that uh, Jean wins, what's going to be next for him? Who does he go after next? Oh, that's a good question. Well, he doesn't have to do a mandatory right away, so they, they can find someone for him to fight. And in the 140-pound division, I mean, there's a bunch of names below, uh, but, you know, I don't know who exactly. I mean, he's, you know, he's putting a cart before the horse, obviously. Um, but, you know, it, it, I, I'll tell you what, they could do a nice defense up in Quebec where he is a very popular fighter. In fact, that, that, that brings, I want to mention something that we talked about, um, uh, at a, that he talked about in our meeting that I find absolutely staggering. There are 120 people from Quebec who are taking a bus down, from Montreal. They're taking a bus on the day of the fight to Washington, D.C., a 10-hour bus ride. And then when the fight is over, they're going to hop on the bus and take another 10-hour bus ride back. Those are, I mean, I, I'm, I, there, I don't even know. As popular as you are, Paulie, would someone take a 10-hour bus ride and go back? I mean, they might, but... I don't think I can get 12 people, let alone 20 people. That's like, who, who can? I don't know. What's with these people? But No, it's pretty amazing. So, so I think he'd probably go back up to Quebec. And, of course, his big concern is just winning the title. But the 140-pound division is... You know, a lot of people moved up, but there's still the, you know, and then, of course, there's the, the division of the promoters, which, which you know, uh, lessens the pool of talent that you have to pick from. But there are a lot. I think 140, you can still find some I'll good tell you, I'll tell you what. I mean, if he wins, it's a bigger win for him winning yeah. this fight than it is for Lamont Peterson. If he wins, and also with his big following in Canada, um, you can best see. bet the fight goes to Canada yeah. or – Wherever the Danny Garcia fight goes, he can probably right. get a Danny Garcia fight because I'm sure Danny Garcia wouldn't be against trying to unify the titles. Absolutely not. Win his fight in March. Yeah, I think that'd be a great fight, and and wow. he's going to fight probably Mauricio Herrera. That's not officially announced, but they're talking about it. Right, Danny Garcia would be great, and if Danny Garcia to make a little extra money, he might want to go up to uh, to Canada. Canada. Yeah. So it would be well, intriguing. It would be just a huge fight up there. Yeah, I mean, oh I, my I, God. I, I'm yeah. thinking about it now. It's yeah. the first time I'm kind of processing it right now as we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. It would be huge. I mean, yeah. the Canadian fans, the Canadian boxing scene right now is incredible. It's, it's it incredible. really the is. The fans really are passionate about yeah. their fighters. Um, big fights in Canada would really, really be amazing. Yeah, the Bell Center. They would put some folks in there. What else we got there, Dan? Well, by far, our, our number one most asked question uh, is for Polly. How bad do you want to rematch with Broner? Ah, uh, Adrian Broner, um. who it appears is going to fight <laughs> our pal, who appears is going to fight Marcos Maidana in a rematch. Um, I really have no interest in a rematch with Adrian Broner at the moment, unless he beats Marcos Maidana. Right. Um, the reason I wanted the rematch was because uh, you know it was uh, the, my title on the line. Um, it was something that I felt like I could get a shot at yeah. what rightfully belonged to me. It was a close enough fight to mandate mm -hmm. a rematch, and we, we, I didn't get the rematch. I almost find it comical that he gets a rematch with Maidana in a fight that was absolutely non-competitive, mm. but, but I don't get a rematch with him. But, you know, that's the boxing landscape. Point. It's a different conversation yeah. for a different time. Yeah, but it, but it's it's intriguing. So I love Maidana, though, once he beats Broner again, because I don't think Broner wins the rematch. Yeah. Well, I, don't, yeah. I don't understand why he asked for that rematch. That seems crazy. It is an interesting... It, it is an interesting... Eagle. Yeah, yeah, it's an, yeah, I guess... Um, do you think he has underestimated what happened in that fight? Or I don't want to say underestimated, or used revisionist thinking to review that fight? Uh, because here's the other issue. Should Adrian Broner be at 147 period, which my inclination, you know better than me because you were in the ring with him, is that 147 is hardly the best weight for him. Yeah. Um, I guess the option can always be to return to, to go down to 140 pounds. If he loses to Maidana again, yeah. I mean, I guess it was always the option either way. Um, you can always play the whole role of, oh, well, he's not a real 140 pounds. Right. I don't know why we got to see it twice to, to let us know yeah, that. Well, but, right, yeah, well, right, But we're going to probably see it twice. I, I I can't see him doing anything to win that rematch. Um, if he throws more punches, he's going to put himself in line to get hit more. Yeah. Um, he does also, and if he gets hit more, the firepower difference is like night and yeah. day with Maidana and him. He's physically not strong enough. Um, he doesn't use his legs enough. I, I, I can't see it. But, hey, man, maybe uh, – 
maybe I'm the one who's crazy. You know, maybe well, he's, maybe he's gonna make, prove us all wrong. But I um I can't see it. Yeah. Uh, I can't see it um at all. And um you know the future for Broner, I think, regardless, ends at all, is at 140 pounds. Yeah. Let's talk about you because the question that had to do with your future. Um. You know, you're of course doing a terrific job on Showtime. Great. I've said this a million times, and I would, yeah, I would applaud Paulie as well. You've been great at doing this, and this is clearly something you're going to make into a great career. But your, you know, after your win against Ab Judah, which was, you know, uh, very good for you, when do you plan to fight again? And do you have any idea what direction it will go in, or is it? Are you waiting to see what happens with Maidan and uh, Broner? Um, I don't think I can wait because uh, yeah. you know I'll be waiting a long time to get a fight. But I think um, you know, looking at the landscape of the 147 pound division, it seems like Broner and Maidan are going to be tied up with each other. So neither of them will fight anyone else until they fight each other. Um, it seems like Danny Garcia, like you said before, is yeah. probably fighting Mauricio Herrera. So that means he's not coming up to the welterweight mm-hmm. division. I mean it. It leaves only so many names open. Um, we'll see. You know, uh, either way, I, I think I'll get a big fight, um, and I look forward to it. And I, you know, I think it'll be uh, probably around springtime. Probably around. Oh, so maybe a few so months. I, I, or... I assume I should know who I'm fighting in that springtime. Right. Pretty soon. Yeah. Like, yeah. I literally like the next week or so. I, I, oh, okay. I, I would anticipate finding out what my next fight will be. So oh, we'll very see. good. All right. Um, and uh, and obviously. You know, you'd like to if you can't get a, a a title somewhere, a fight that would spring you to absolutely you still know, get a title. Big fights are, are what yeah, counts, yeah, yeah the right. ones that pay good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At this point, the belts are are, are there, but not the major focus. Uh, anything else there, Dan? You know, I I have kind of a questionable question here, but I'm going to throw it out here. I'm 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 bordering on this. Uh, Something I, questionable on the social yeah, media. It's a, yeah, well, it's, yeah. It could, this could, Never this happened. is bordering. This is bordering on a hater question, but I'm okay. I'm going to put it out there anyway because I think it's cool. a reasonable question. Uh, Peters Peterson got busted one time before for for oh, doping, yeah. right? So. Yeah. Um, the the question I had two of them that so they're on the same line. Do you think that there's a, a higher probability that he might go back to that after that Matisse loss? Oh well, that's an intriguing uh, statement. Of course, he would question the validity of what happened to begin with. But 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 you know he he talked to us today about all the the blood testing that he's had to do and how he ended up doing more of it. Um, it's an interesting question, only in the sense. I mean, I don't think it's even a hater question. I think it's actually kind of a uh, for a fan that knows it, and he has to live with the fact that he did test positively yeah. with it. Um, and and even though Lamont Peterson, it's interesting about Lamont Peterson because he's really a great guy and and solid, you know, works at his craft and whatever. But at the end of the day, he still has to answer for that test. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I wouldn't anticipate Lamont going back. I think um, he has to kind of get used to. The fact that, you know, whether he did it knowingly or not knowingly, right. we'll never know for right. sure. But um, he has to get used to the fact that there will be random drug test fights yeah. if he wins this fight, especially. You know, yep. the bigger fights are all randomly drug tested at this point. So so uh, I would assume he's he would know he'd have to get used to fighting under clean circumstances regardless. Um, I don't know for sure that he knowingly took anything or not. Right. That's we'll the, never know that. Right. But regardless, I think he's going to be careful and not do anything sure. questionable. We got a couple more minutes here. We'll take. Is there any more questions that uh, pop up? Uh, that's about what we have for right now, um, okay. as far as on the question side. All right, I, um, Paulie. The the uh, uh, I want to mention. Ask one quick question about another fight this weekend. Mikey Garcia, who's taking on Juan Carlos Burgos. Um, Mike Garcia is a really good fighter. How? Do, what's your assessment of him as a fighter and as a potential star? And could he? Now there's whispers of him uh, maybe even getting up to 140 and fighting Pacquiao. Does that feel too high for him, or what do you think of uh, Mikey Garcia in general? Yeah, I, I think 140 pounds is a bit too high for Garcia. I think um, I think with the ascension of random drug tests in all big fights, you'll stop seeing so many guys jumping up so many sure, weight classes. Sure, And I think, yeah. that, I think that ties hand in hand with probably what was mm-hmm. going on before. Um, I think Mike Garcia is an excellent fighter. Yeah. Uh, I don't see him moving to 140 and having the same kind of power as right. he's had at 26 right. and 30, but I do see him as a very, very good fighter. Uh, technical skills, um, very well-schooled, and uh, incredible natural punching power mm-hmm. and you combine that with the with the uh, textbook boxing style that he has he, right. he maximizes all the power in his fists so so um, a good boxer great power all right great um, before we leave you uh, I want to mention that uh, 
we're going to, first of all, let's show the people where they can get to Pauli Malignaggi on Twitter. He is the, the self-proclaimed Twitter's king, but I wouldn't argue with it because he is a Twitter king. And, uh, you know, uh, what can we say? But anyway, let, there's where you can reach Pauli uh, on, on Twitter. And you are very Fresh. great. Oh, well, do we do make yeah, a mistake? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, that's, we're good. Yeah, no, no. That's, yeah, so it's at Paul Malignaggi. And um, you're really great with the, uh, uh, you know, you had a, a one patch where you decided to get off Twitter. Yeah, I, I had to go into a brief retirement. A brief retirement, but then you came I had back. To keep them hungry. Yeah, exactly. Then you came back with a flourish. It's fascinating to be able to communicate with people so directly, isn't it? It's fascinating. Uh, social media has really <laughs> um, made tremendous leaps and bounds. Yeah. Um, but it, I think in keeping the fans involved to that extent yeah. is actually something cool, and it makes them look forward more to yeah. seeing People like me fight, you know. Uh, Absolutely. You interact with a guy, you almost feel like you know him, even if you've never met him. And if you feel like you know somebody, you can. It's easier to root for him or even against him. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No. Either either way you look at. It. Well, anyway, get to Polly on Twitter. I couldn't agree more with that. And I was actually going to mention the fact that you know, since Polly's been on the uh, show Showtime broadcast, you know, I'm a West Coast guy. And you know, I, I I'm a big boxing fan, but I'm a West Coast guy, and I'm not wasn't always definitely on a on a poly side. But you know what? Since you've been on Showtime, and I've got to know you a lot more through the broadcast, and a lot more about uh, your level of knowledge about the sport and how you interact with people mm -hmm. and your respect of all of it, it has completely. I'm I'm the biggest poly fan ever now. And uh, well, and it, I, that's really an interesting point, Dan, because you you're not a you you. When you know during your boxing career, you you're an out there personality. You're somebody that uh, even even Dan's making the point regionally. You know people can even root against fighters because they're not from where they're from and whatever. But yeah. you've trans the, the Showtime situation has kind of helped you transcend that a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely been a, a blessing and something positive for my career. You know, here's the thing. You're on television when you fight two, maybe three times a year. Right. Um, getting a chance to work on Showtime, you're on television a lot more often. Right. So seeing is believing for people. Yeah. Um, seeing, and they can truly hear your personality. You know, when you're true. a fighter, uh, Antonio Tavares, it's a perfect example, your predecessor, who did a very good job, uh, was yeah. a very good commentator, and, and uh, I hope to hear him more doing commentary. Antonio was a very polarizing figure in a way. And I think many people were shocked to get to see his personality on air and say, "Man, I like that guy." Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you get to see the real us and mm -hmm. out of the fight element. You know, um, yeah. when fighters are getting ready for fights, it, it's it's different. kind of difficult. You yeah. got to put yourself in a, in a different uh, mindset. You know, and mm -hmm. so it's uh, a lot of times it's not sure. always the real us you're seeing. Um, you're seeing that that right. game face, so to yeah. speak. Um, I think. Um, you get to see uh, a different side of me, a different side of Antonio when working the uh, broadcast. See the fan side because, right? In, in a lot of ways, I'm a fan of boxing. How you as appreciate much as I am, the sport? Yeah, and I'm a fan of boxing as much as I am a fighter in an, uh, myself. You know, mm -hmm. so I get excited for these big fights just like everybody sure. else gets excited for them. You know, I, I it's just I'm, I feel fortunate enough to also be a part of them. But so you get to see the other side of it, and you get a different perspective uh, if you're a fan. Right. And I'll close this by saying something that that uh, uh, that is really true. And I'm not saying just because Paulie's around here. I've said it a million times. One of the nice things about what you do, and you just kind of expressed it as a commentator, is you you use your own experiences to talk about with knowledge what's happening, but you don't make an ego-driven thing. It's not about you, but it's about the experiences and the knowledge you have of it. And I think boxing fans really appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of let people know without trying to toot your own horn. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, I, and you do that really well. So, Paulie, thank you very much for, for joining us. Dan, we're going to have our next... Uh, um, well, our next Hangout is going to be early in February, uh, and we're going to be taking – people are going to be able to come online and video – uh, you know, uh, and talk to me and ask questions. We're going to do a random – we're going to throw it open to, to any question, so I'm a brave man, you know, to any <laughs> question they want to ask. Uh, and uh, we're going to do that in early February. We'll announce today, but on February 25th, Paul uh, Galander, who is a, a fine author, wrote a terrific book about Sonny Liston, is going to be with us because it's a special anniversary. Yes, sir. It is the 50th anniversary of Ali Liston One, and uh, apparently we're going to get some uh, some news breaking revelations during this hangout. Ah. So I am really, really excited for this one. It should be a lot of fun. It's February 25th. So Dan, thank you as always for your great efforts, and uh, we thank Pauli Malnagy for visiting with us. This is one of the, the most fun hangouts we could possibly have, and uh, be sure and watch. Uh, 
um, the fight between uh, Lamont Peterson and Gary Jean, and also Gabe Rosado uh, taking on uh, Jermel Charlo uh, Saturday uh, the 25th on Showtime. And that's how you can reach us. Uh, you can reach me uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, Google+, Plus, Foursquare. It seems like I'm everywhere now that I look at that. <laughs> I'm only some places, but yeah. So feel free to, to give me a contact, and uh, we appreciate everybody joining us for the Hangout. We'll see you next time.